We have access to more information today than at any other point in history. There's plenty of data, theory, tools and programs available to help inform our decisions. So how can we use this information along with our intuition, our past experience, our preferences and our values, along with the level of risk that we want to take on, to make sure we make good decisions for our situation. In this video, I'll take you through a simple process I use called a decision matrix. I first saw this from South Australian farmer, Barry Mudge. Decision matrices are simply a process to think through a decision. By taking a step-by-step -step approach, it slows down your thinking and allows you to consider the critical factors that are important so that we don't make a hasty decision that we may regret later on. I've got a folder full of them. These decisions, as simple as do I graze this crop or apply nitrogen, to more complex ones such as destocking, changing lambing times, or even selling or buying land. The example I'm gonna take you through is one that's common to a lot of livestock producers, and that's around selling stock. Come on, Rose. In our environment, we're highly reliant on a favorable spring to grow enough feed to take us through summer and autumn. Poor springs mean animals are in lighter condition late in summer, unless we do a lot of feeding. Commonly, when feeding starts, prices fall as people also offload stock. On our farm, Fiona manages the livestock and the marketing, and I look after the pastures, the water, and the soil. So how can we both be on the same page so that we can make good decisions, and importantly, make them earlier than others? Decision matrices are really valuable in allowing us to be really objective about how we are looking at livestock numbers. I can use my knowledge of markets and how livestock are performing and then we can look at CAM's information on feed supply and make really objective decisions. So how do you build a decision matrix? It involves a few steps. The first step is to clearly define the decision. This might sound a little bit simple, but unless we're clear about the decision we need to make, it's very hard to get the critical factors right. This can be harder than it sounds. In this case, the decision is, do we need to adjust stock numbers? Once we've defined our decision, it's sometimes worth thinking about the timing of the decision, especially if it's a recurring one. In this case, we chose early spring, and we use this matrix every year at the same time. It's just each year the decision might be different. Step three is to make a list of the critical factors that are involved. Quite often there are six or eight of these critical factors that we need to consider. These often start with the facts, such as how much feed we might have available, but can and should also include other gut feel and emotional factors, such as ability to supplementary feed if needed, or implications on cash flow. So when we consider selling off stock in this situation, the critical factors we consider are our current feed supply, the seasonal forecast, especially rainfall, the stored soil moisture we have, the weight and condition of stock, the current price of stock, and the future price of stock, and supplementary feeding. Once we're happy with the list of critical factors, we then look at thresholds within each of those critical factors. These thresholds are simply points where we think differently about our decision. They don't have to be overly scientific, often descriptions will do. Your thresholds may be different to these, and that's fine because every farm's different and every decision is going to be different. Usually in building these, we take each critical factor in turn and we think about What's the best possible outcome within reason that we could describe for that critical factor? Once we've done that, we then think about what would be the worst possible outcome for that critical factor, where we would think differently in our decision making. So if we take something like the amount of feed that we've got on offer, if we had above two and a half tonne of feed early September, we're probably sitting pretty well compared to our worst possible situations where we could be as low as a thousand kilograms of, of feed per hectare across the farm would make a different decision. These values come from a combination of past experience and feed budgeting. These two descriptions act as bookends, the best and the worst descriptions when I'd think differently. Then I can add in any mid-range descriptions where I think differently again. If you're wondering about where to find information or grow your skill in deciding on these thresholds, check out the video on making a form guide. Step five is to assign scores relative to the other critical factors. And this is really important because although all of those critical factors we've listed should be considered, 
some are likely to be more important than others and we have to put this weighting into perspective. The way I do this is first of all start with the worst possible descriptions for each critical factor and put them as zero. So for our decision about selling stock, if our current feed supply is less than 1,000 kilograms of feed per hectare, it gets zero and so on. We go through and complete all the zero scores first. I then go to the best possible descriptions for each of those critical factors and I look to put a score on them but relative to each other. So some of them may be higher than others simply because I put more importance or more weight on them. So in this example, the current feed supply is having more than 2,500 kilos a hectare. We give a score of six, which we consider to be relatively more important than say the seasonal forecast, even if it's well above average decile seven or more. And we go through for each of those most favorable conditions for the critical factors we've listed. Once we've got those top and bottom decisions and scores on them, we can then start looking at middle values if it's appropriate. I find there's a bit of adjustment here where we've got to go between those different scores until we're happy with the relative weighting. Our next step is to decide on the possible decisions that we might make. Again, it's easier to start with the extreme ends of the decision from doing nothing to drastic action. So if we had a lot of feed in front of us, market conditions are really good, the seasonal forecast was that it was going to be a fine season, then our decision wouldn't be to sell stock. In fact, if anything, we might look at weed control or fodder conservation or whatever else. I then look at the flip side of that and think, if we had the worst possible conditions where we don't have much feed, the seasonal forecast was really poor, supplements were really hard to get, we had no soil moisture and so on, then it's a pretty easy decision we'd actually sell some stock and sell quite aggressively and then reassess it a bit further down the track. Those two decisions bookend what you need to do. Then there may be some other intermediary decisions that you make, but at least we've got our top and bottom. Which animals to sell requires a different matrix to this one. Step seven is to assign scores to those different decisions. I find this the trickiest bit because these values are heavily influenced by the amount of risk you're prepared to take on. And as risk is a personal thing, there's no right answer. However, I'll share you an approach I use. To start, add all the highest scores together to figure out our maximum. In this case, it's 27. I set my first score at about 70% of this maximum value. So in the case, 70% of 27 is 18.9. So I round it to 19. I then set my lowest score at 50%, in this case 13.5, so I round it to 14. Now I have three ranges, greater than 19, less than 14, and by default, a middle range of 14 to 19. That 70% is entirely up to you. That's based on the amount of risk that you want to take on. If you were more conservative and didn't want to take on as much risk, that score may be higher. If you were a bit more aggressive and you were willing to have a go, then that score might be a bit lower. The last step is then to start running some scenarios. And what I find useful is start to think about uh, previous events and previous years where we can actually go back and say, I know what the outcome was like. These were the conditions, score that, and then find out does the scores add up and give you a decision that was the right decision in hindsight? If it doesn't, then you adjust your scores, either within the matrix or within the, the decision table. In this example, after running some scenarios, we changed the best critical factor score from 19 to 20. If you wanted to take less risk about being stuck with animals as the season turns bad, your decision score to sell might be 16 or 17 instead of 14. And there you have it, a handy process to help you make some decisions on your farm. The decision matrix has some other values as well. It firstly documents your thinking and so lets other people contribute and also understand your critical factors, your decision points and your scores. Secondly, it helps identify what information and skills you need to choose a score. This can be really helpful to focus on the important information you need and block out the noise. And finally, you can revisit it after the event and change aspects to make it better over time. There are other tools available to assist in building these matrices and to help define your position on risk. 
just search for Decision Wizard to use this simple online tool. I trust you've got some value out of this video to help you make good and hopefully right decisions into the future.